Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We will begin our webinar now. It looks like we have a good turnout. So it's wonderful to see everyone. Uh, my name is Tamara Lawrence. I'm a member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, VOW, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILP. And I'm also a fellow with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, CFPI. And these are the three groups that have organized tonight's events. I will put links in the chat uh, to these organizations' websites. I am speaking to you from Waterloo, Ontario, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the neutral peoples of the Grand River. Um, and just as the federal government's domestic policies towards Indigenous communities in this country has been racist and violent, so too has Canada's foreign policies been to other countries, especially Haiti. In Canada, we have started to have a reckoning through a truth and reconciliation process to understand and to be accountable for the history of injustice, immiseration, and trauma that we have caused to other Indigenous countries. Um, to other uh, Indigenous communities, but Canada has not yet had a truth and reconciliation process for our foreign policy. And we need one, and it must begin with what Canada is doing and has done to Haiti. We are holding this event to mark Black History Month and to mark the anniversary of Canada's involvement in the coup against the democratically elected government of President Jean-Bertrand Aristide in Haiti in 2004. And this coup that Canada launched with the United States and France against the Aristide government 19 years ago has led to the current crisis in Haiti today. And this important backstory um, is what is powerfully explained in Elaine Briere's important documentary that I hope you've all had a chance to watch. Um, and if you hadn't ha haven't had the chance to watch it, you can go to the foreignpolicy.ca website. We will put a link uh, to that in the chat. And there is a free, there is a free link uh, to the film that you can watch. And we also encourage you to, um, uh, to have others watch the film as well. So our event tonight is auspiciously timed. Our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, is in Nasa, Bahamas at the CARICOM a heads of government meeting. CARICOM refers to the Caribbean community and common market. CARICOM co uh, comprises 20 Caribbean countries, but Canada is not one of them. Canada is not a member of CARICOM. Nevertheless, Trudeau is in the Bahamas and he's at this meeting to drum up support for the core group's nefarious plans for Haiti. And today, Trudeau met with the unelected appointed leader of Haiti, Ariel Henry, and I encourage you to check out Trudeau's a Twitter account of this meeting. You will see a picture of Trudeau sitting across the table from uh, Ariel uh, Henry and his delegation. And on the side with Trudeau is Canada's National Security Advisor, Judy Thomas, Canada's Ambassador to the United Nations, Bob Ray, and Canada's Ambassador to Haiti, Sébastien Carrière. Um, they're sitting together on one side of the table. And, you know, this is what the, the, the white overlords of the, care, uh, the core group looked like. This is the group that is dictating what, what Haiti must do. Um, the core group is comprised of not only uh, government officials from Canada, but also from France, the United States, Spain, Brazil, Germany, the European Union, United Nations, and the Organization of American States. The core group is a racist, neo-colonial Western group that is usurping Haiti's sovereignty and impeding its self-determination. At CARICOM, Trudeau made the, the uh, announcement about more so-called humanitarian assistance to Haiti to deal with the current crisis. And shockingly, but not surprisingly, Trudeau said that Canada would be deploying two Kingston-class warships to the country. I mean, this is... This is a, a new form of gunboat diplomacy. Canada has already sent military armored vehicles, 
surveillance aircraft to Haiti. And we know that Canada is coordinating closely with Washington. There is no doubt that this is a military intervention in the making, and this is what we must resist. So as Canadians, we must stop the Trudeau government and put pressure on the other political parties to say, no military event intervention and let the Haitian people control their own country and destiny, hands off Haiti. So um, with that, we're going to turn it over to our panel. I do want to let you know that we are live streaming this to Facebook. There is a link in the chat to the, the Facebook uh, page where you can share this link on your Facebook pages as well to help promote this important uh, panel. So we will hear from four speakers and then we'll, we will have a question and answer period and we will finish at uh, nine o'clock. I encourage you to put your questions and your comments and any resources in the chat and we will save the chat and we will send you a follow-up email after this event. So our first speaker is Elaine Briere. We are very, very grateful that Elaine can join us and that she has allowed us to show her film, Haiti Betrayed, freely at the CFPI website. I have seen this, this film twice and both times it has brought me to tears. Elaine is a documentary filmmaker and a photographer who is based in British Columbia. Her most recent film, Haiti Betrayed, has been translated into French and Spanish, and it has screened at many different film festivals. It was recently screened at the Vancouver International Film Festival, and Elaine did an excellent television interview with Global News about her film. And I will put a link to this interview in the chat because she did just a superb job. So Elaine, it's your turn now. Thank you very much. Elaine, I think you're still muted. Yeah, that would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> I just want to say good evening. It's afternoon for Gary and me. And uh, hello, Jean Saintville, how are you? And um, um, that was a very good interview, I, really. Anyway, I'm just going to give a little bit of background on the film and uh, that people might be interested in. I, I first went to Haiti in October of 1996 with my partner, David Putt. Um, we were pretty uninformed about Haiti. We were really naive. Um, this changed very quickly when David started doing uh, water and sanitation projects in the poor neighborhoods in Port-au-Prince. And we you know, we would talk to teachers and people in these areas because we were curious about the recent history of Haiti. And uh, we learned a lot. I mean, they, they people were still critical of our last, but they were also said it's the best government they ever had. It was the best um, period in their, the first government they ever had that Gave, was genuinely serving the people and doing their best to provide, you know, uh, health care, schools. Um, they were always pointing out that market was built by Aristide or this this orphanage or this, uh, this uh, people worked on this road, people had jobs. So, so we, th this is where we basically started to really get a feeling for really what happened in Haiti. And another thing that you couldn't help but notice, this was October of 1996, Port-au-Prince was very heavily militarized. The, the Minusta presence was everywhere. Um, there were armored vehicles and UN trucks with they'd have four soldiers in the back, all with guns pointing out. And they were just patrolling, the, especially the poor neighborhoods all day long. And there was a curfew at night. Um, and especially, they were especially visible in places like City Soleil, where we were working. Um, City Soleil was still considered a kind of a hotbed of Lavalas, uh, you know, activity. Um, it was a very oppressive era in the city. Um, and you just had to wonder, like, like, who's the enemy? Like, 
what is all this military presence about? Because it, it was really, it was really kind of a, a weird, weird, eerie situation. But I wasn't in Haiti very long on this first visit. Actually, I, I, I left uh, just a couple of days before the earthquake to go back to university in Vancouver. Um, but shortly before I left, I, I went, I paid a visit to Chamas, the big city square in the downtown Port-au-Prince. Um, I remember it was a Sunday, the square was full of people. It was teeming with vendors and very busy. And um, I wasn't there very long when an incident happened that really deeply moved me and educated me very quickly about what was going on in Port-au-Prince. A man started uh, waving his arms at me and shouting, Bland, Bland, you don't know what they do to us, help us, you don't know what. And he must have thought I was a journalist because I had a, a camera around my neck. So I, um, I was afraid that there was UN troops circling the whole square and I was afraid they were gonna go and take him away or think he was bothering me or something. So I went over to the man and um, he took his hat off. He was a very neatly dressed older man. He took his hat off and he started crying. And he was saying, help us. You don't know what they do to us. They're killing us. We're just poor people and tell them to stop. And so I, I held what, his hand for a while and he gradually quit, calmed down and he stopped crying and he put his hat back on and he turned around and left and he walked through the crowd. And um, I mean, it was a deeply a moving encounter. And I think in some ways it influenced me to make this film as, as kind of an answer to this man, this unknown man who I don't know who he was, but he, and another influence to make this film was the earthquake. Um, Two days after I returned to Canada, the earthquake happened and David, my partner was still there, but he survived. He and his crew immediately started delivering water to the shanty, you know, to, well, to their own neighborhood and then to schools and especially the, these little clinics that were popping up all over the city. And what, what happened was that there, were, there was no aid coming in and, and, and people were just overwhelmed. Um, there was almost, no, you know, pretty the few medicines and antibiotics and bandages that people have were used up very quickly. And the reason that the aid was blocked at the airport by the Americans and, and the Canadians too, is that they were harboring a fantasy that Aristide was gonna come back and foment an uprising. And this is what prevented the aid getting through. So instead of helping all of these thousands of people buried under the rubble, instead of providing bandages and medicines and antibiotics for crush industries, they were they they just delayed the aid for over two over two weeks. Nothing came out, and then it came out in a trickle. And when the aid did come out, it just it was surrounded, there was a truck surrounded by two Humvees with armed guard, armed American troops on either side, uh, shepherding the aid. It went straight up the hill to Petionville, the wealthier area of town where they needed it much less than people did in, in the other neighbor, poor neighborhoods. So um, anyway, that was, that was very shocking, this whole treatment, this whole, I mean, it's one reason the death toll was so high in Haiti was the delay of the aid. Now, when David came home three months later, I mean, he was exhausted or traumatized, but I mean, we really started to learn in earnest as much about Haiti as we could. He wanted to go back immediately as soon as he could gather some money together to do more aid projects and water projects. And I decided to start making a film um, so I, that's how I started making a film in, about the coup in 2004 was after the earthquake. We went back in the spring of 2011. We went back several times since and gradually it, it all came together. Um, 
I'd just like to say a few words about Patrick Kelly, who tirelessly devoted his life to the return of democracy in Haiti. Um, he was the first person I interviewed. He was really an anchor for me and for this film all the way through. He was particularly enthusiastic about the film because it was about Canada, a country he had a lot of fondness for. Um, he lived, he was actually a Canadian citizen. He lived in Canada for several years doing his biochemistry degree. His children are in Canada. He always said, I like visiting Canada because I could walk on the sidewalks, which we don't have in Port-au-Prince. But he never wanted to live there. I mean, he said, no, I, I never really want, I never want to live in Canada because the easy life is not for me. He said he preferred to be in Haiti where his life had meaning and had had purpose and he felt he was doing something. And um, so I think Patrick would be very happy to see this webinar happening today and the struggle continuing. Because I mean, the last time I visited him, he was very ill. He really shouldn't have been doing interviews, but he was just anybody that wanted to talk about Haiti right to the end, he was there. So I'll just start there and uh, thank you very much. Yeah. I hope I didn't exceed my 10 minutes. Yeah. No, you didn't. And you still had more time. Um, so thank you so much for your remarks. Thank you so much for remembering uh, Patrick at Eli. We, um, we coordinated with him uh, many years ago after the coup uh, with the Canada Haiti Solidarity Network, having him uh, speak and and connecting with him. So it's 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 good uh, to to remember him, to honor him, and thank you again, Elaine, so much for making this important film. The cruelty of Canadian foreign policy is on full display in your film, and it's really urgent that all Canadians watch this film, because what is happening um, in Haiti, what Canada is doing to Haiti is 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 what Canada is doing to, to many other countries. And so we need to, to understand our role in Haiti and um, and we, and the truth behind Canadian foreign policy. So our next speaker is Jeffrey Kaiti, also known as Jean Saint Bill. Uh, he is featured in Elaine's documentary. Jeffrey Kaiti is an Ottawa-based author, radio host, and social justice activist who publishes in English, Creole, and French on his blog, jeffreykaiti.com. We will put a link to that blog in the chat. And with his Solidarité Quebec Haiti comrades, Jeffrey Kaiti continuously calls on the Canadian government to stop interfering in the governance of his native Haiti. I encourage you to follow him on Twitter and we put a link uh, to his handle in the chat. And he also uses the hashtag, hashtag Black Nationhood Matters. And I also want to say that I first met Jeffrey Kaiti when we organized an event for him to speak a uh, after the coup it, in 2004, we had a very well attended packed audience at St. Mary's University. And um, I wonder if you remember that the program was about two hours in total, but you stood up there without notes and spoke for two hours straight. And it was a powerful, heart pounding presentation. And at the end of it, every single person in that room jumped to their feet and gave you a standing ovation. It was the most dynamic speech that I have ever heard in my life. I will always remember that, Jeffrey Kaiti. So now it is your turn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tama. You, you're bringing such uh, memories to me because this was also the first trip with our uh, daughter who was uh, newly born and uh, um, I've always had a lot of love for Eastern Canada because I, I felt that vibration in that room at that time. And it's also what I think motivated me because I see that Canadian foreign policy is so different than Canadians. <laughs> Canadians that I've met in, in Nova Scotia, uh, in Vancouver. I mean, it, it just strikes us. And, and again, it when I noticed that Elaine uh, had 
Patrick Ali at the end of the film and Patrick, you know, the fact that he always ended his speeches when Canadians are asking, you know, how can we help Haiti with the single answer, you know, be a citizen of your own country. Uh, and it's, it's a version of what this man was telling to Elaine in Haiti, you know, uh, tell them, tell them we are human beings. And this has been the cry of the Africans since uh, they were being transported from the shores of Africa to come here. And it's, you know, I don't understand how come as a human community, we don't realize uh, how much of a stain it is on all of us that in 2023, the people whose ancestors were being taken from Africa to go uh, on, on those slave ships uh, in the Caribbean are now leaving that one oasis of freedom that they had created for themselves because that island has been made inhospitable to them and 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 then they're rushing to uh, to go to Latin America or to go to US and just today our prime minister uh, you know uh, who likes to talk about black history month and all of that uh, you know, you're facing 12 million people who are looking for water, for food, for health care, and they had made the effort to put in power the governance that is supposed to deliver that to them. You overthrow that government, you put a bunch of criminals in power, and now, essentially, those naval ships, uh, uh, you know, I was doing an interview just before this, uh, with CTV and telling them, you know, you journalists, have you asked the prime minister, what is the logic of sending warships <laughs> to Haiti where there is no army, okay? Um, and, you know, people don't realize that this is not new. They did that after the earthquake. They did that after the coup in 1991. And the sole purpose of sending those warships in the waters of Haiti is to stop Black Haitians from reaching the shores of Florida. That's the only purpose. Now, as a human community, how can we live with ourselves, you know, knowing that, that for hundreds of years, these Africans have fought to propose a different way of being. That is, we do not need to establish our riches on the sweat and blood of other people whom we impoverish. That is the gift of the Haitian revolution. Unfortunately, when you see people talk about the current situation, they completely avoid what is discussed in Hélène Briere's film. Okay, uh, you would think that, uh, you know, everything collapsed with the assassination of Jovenel Moïse, because that's how they're presenting it. You know, like there's mayhem uh, after the assassination of the president. That's not true, okay? We Haitians know that for the past 11 years, I don't know one person in the Haitian community I can talk to who cannot identify a person who was kidnapped. That's not normal. We never had that. And so the other thing that I think we will need more films to be made about, uh, because, you know, Elaine's film touches upon it, but not in detail. And the reason why in the last few years I have been insisting on that in the media is because I realize that it's done on purpose that they avoid the topic, that is, what I call the 15 white mafia families in Haiti. Of course, the Canadian government in their list of sanctions, reluctantly, okay, because they had all kinds of people they were naming and all of these were criminals, but there are certain criminals they left till the end, okay? And it's because people like Solidarity Quebec IT, we kept on pressuring them. This is, you know, you, you're still not talking about the real kidnappers. And so finally, they put Sheriff Abdallah, Gilbert Bijou, who is the billionaire, okay? How are you a billionaire in a country where most people cannot even have drinking water? What kind of business makes you a billionaire in Haiti? Well, it's not complicated because these folks have been in cahoots with dictatorships of Duvalier. They don't pay taxes. 
And whenever there's a government like the Aristide government that asks them to increase the minimum wage, they prefer to collect money among themselves with the help of the CIA, conduct a coup. And that's what they've done again and again. And if you look at the last um, press release that the US Justice Department uh, did yesterday, it was laughable. And, and on top of it, they use a, a, a cynical form of racism uh, that you know they need to realize doesn't work anymore. They took a Haitian, uh, an American of Haitian origin to do the press release <laughs> and, and, and to bring uh, the, the news that they've finally arrested some of the folks in Florida who are in that CTU company that we always knew were involved in the assassination of Jovenel Moise. But what we are not being told is how come these guys were working for the FBI, some of them were working for the DEA, they had DEA badges, Yet they're saying that, well, the FBI was not aware. This wasn't an official FBI operation. Well, we need to explain that because Haitians have been saying that Jovenel Moïse was imposed as a puppet president and they killed him in order to get PHTK, the regime, to continue because he had no more mandate. Okay, so what we are really facing right now and in terms of what we are proposing that the Canadian government should be doing, because sometimes they accuse us of saying that, well, we're against everything. No, we're not against everything. We are against a coup, okay? Uh, um, you know, Bob Ray, when he came back from Haiti in December, he said that we don't wanna make the same mistakes of the past. Uh, with all due respect, Mr. Ray, conducting a coup Removing 7,000 elected officials of a friendly country is not an error. It's a crime against humanity. And therefore, reparations are owed to the people of Haiti. The other uh, question is that they are calling for a return of the Forces Armée d'Haïti, uh, the army. And people need to realize what the army is in Haiti. Uh, that repressive force was established by the Americans during the 1915 occupation when the Americans picked the mulatto, the light-skinned, uh, white-passing Haitians and put them as head of government. If you look at the presidents of Haiti from the invasion of 1915 all the way to 1946, they're all white-looking, just like the leaders of the Dominican Republic. In other words, what the fantasy that these foolish people have in mind is white minority rule in Haiti. And every time the Haitians fight against that, they gang up and come back with the same foolish idea. And that's why they say they sanctioned Bijo, Abdallah, Dib, Bosa, who are indeed the people who are getting all these weapons and mobilizing gangs in Haiti to protect their fiefdoms. But the sanction for someone who is doing kidnappings is not to stop them from importing some of their products. It's to arrest them, judge them, put them in jail, and to take the resources that they have stolen from an impoverished people and put it in a national budget so that Haitians can have hospitals, universities, drinking water for crying out loud, you know, reinvigorating our rice production. And so, I'll end by saying that when Canadians like Hélène Bouillère um, face her own contradictions, because a lot of uh, the people that I met, Tamara, at that meeting in, in, in Nova Scotia, they said, Jean, you've disturbed us with your speech because we grew up with the reflex of trusting what we see on CBC Radio-Canada. And what you're saying to us doesn't match what we knew about our country. Well, I told them, listen, don't believe me. Buy a plane ticket and go see for yourself. And you know what? Some of them did. And that's why I have tremendous love for the raging grannies, you know, these grandmothers in Canada who demonstrate for peace, not people who are doing lip service uh, to the issue of peace, but people who actually take to the streets and, and, and demand that we take humanity uh, on a different path. And so 
that means we can change Canadian foreign policy, but it's going to take courage. It's going to take people who go out of their comfort zone. And it's also especially going to take from Black Canadians to stop being sheep. You know, people who stay quiet when Canada is committing crimes against Haiti and we're saying we're celebrating Black history. How are you celebrating Black history when you pay no respect to Black nationhood? So the idea is that, you know, and I've called Michael Jean up. You know, you were Governor General of Canada. It doesn't, you know, escape us that they made this nomination one year after the coup in order to blind people to what was really happening. Okay, representing the Queen of England, okay, a family that built its riches on the blood and sweat of Africans and haven't paid a cent in reparations in those hundreds of years. That's what Mikhail Jean should have been doing in that position. Instead, she stayed quiet. And now today, she has the gall to be helping pimp that story that, uh, well, Haiti needs another invasion. Uh, Haiti has failed. Haiti has not failed, okay? The foreign troops toppled the government of Haiti and they need to repair the damage that they have caused because my mother would not be in cold Ottawa tonight if we had our country. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much again, Jeffrey Kaiti, for your uh, powerful remarks. Um, you are absolutely right. What Canada has done to Haiti is a crime and there needs to be accountability. The Canadian political elite are elected officials. The mainstream media are not telling the Canadian public the truth about what is going on. So it really is up to us to get the word out and to show more courage, more activism to change the course of Canadian foreign policy. Um, we do need to demand reparations, restitution, rebuilding, uh, accountability. Uh, I want to also bring to everyone's attention that Jeffrey Kaiti has written an excellent article. It's called uh, A Legacy of Canadian Intervention in Haiti 20 Years On. Uh, we're going to put a link to that article in the chat and we encourage you to, to, to read it and to share it. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker all the way from Jeremy Haiti, uh, Georges Gabriel Paul. Gabi is a graduate of the École supérieure catholique du droit de Jérémy. She is a human rights activist and the founder and president of the Fondation Julia Ejad, which works to empower women and their communities and to assist uh, farmers who produce organic beans, corn, and other crops. She's also a co-host of a radio show called Génération Début at Extension uh, FM in Jeremy. We are going to be raising money for Fondation Julia and Jade, and we are going to be sending some money to uh, Gabby uh, for her important work. And we're going to be doing this through the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. So we're going to put our contact information in the chat. And if you are able to make a donation, that would be will, really wonderful. We will we will compile all of the donations and we will sell, send it directly to Gabby. So Gabby, it is now your turn. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. It's a, a real pleasure to be with you tonight. But uh, it seems Jaffrey knew what I will tell because every time I got an opportunity to talk um, about the reality of Haiti, so, um, it's a, it's an honor because I think the truth deserves to be known. And um, um, well, you know, it's just the only thing I want to say tonight. Excuse me, excuse me, just my son just being hold on. Sorry, it's just my son is three years old. <laughs> So, um, yes, um, the only thing I want to tell you tonight or to share with you tonight, it's, um, I think, 
and what the people of Haiti will tell the world if they get the chance. And um, so it's not like, it's not favor. It's uh, just a cry from the heart, a cry from our mother's womb to protect our children, our men, our family, our nation. Um, what I want to tell you tonight is we are human, indeed we are. Um, we have blood running through our veins, like, you know, um, Canadian people, American people, people from France, England, and everywhere else. And, uh, and we know what we want. We want for, for our country and, um, and the way we want to get those stuff done. And uh, we, know, we know what we want, how to want our country. And um, we are smart. We are smart. We are intelligent in Haiti. And uh, we have people who can work hard. We are working hard. And uh, we love our children. We want to protect our families like everyone else, any nations want to. So, um, so um, we want to build our future in our country. And um, we have dream like anyone else. And um, again, we are human. And um, so we will ask you to tell your government, we don't need what they, what they are, we don't deserve what they are doing to our country. So what we need, we need friend, of course, we need true partner, but we want them to stay away from our, our country. So if they come to work with us, if when you come to somewhere house, you don't, you know, you don't order, you don't say what you want that person to do, you ask, you ask permission. Usually when Haitian came, you knock on the door and uh, in the countryside, people said, when someone come, the person said, oh, ne. and the people inside of the house answer, respect. So, so you come with honor, with respect, and we will talk to you, we will work with you. We just, we, we don't say, we don't want you not to, you know, cooperate with us, working with us, but we need, we deserve, we ask to let us build our country in dignity. So, because every day you, you listen to the news, you, you turn on the TV, radio, it's the way, they treat Haitian people everywhere. It's the way our government treat us because our life didn't matter. So they are killing us. So dogs, every animals um, are eating our, you know, parts in the streets. And the worst thing happening, it's not to be able to bury our loved one. And I think that's the worst thing can, you know, can happen to someone when you don't have the possibility to see your loved one who passed away or they killed. And actually that's what's going on. It's been a long time it's going on since uh, four or five years when they, the gang start killing people, they just take the body too. And um, it's like about, yeah, a month ago when they killed six officers, police officers, they took all the bodies. So they, the family didn't get the chance. No family didn't have a chance to bury their loved one. And that's the worst thing because as a person and uh, knowing our culture, our loved one who passed away deserve respect. They deserve a proper, you know, um, funerals. So when you take away that from a from a from people from a nation from a family, I think that's the worst thing can happen to someone. So that's where we are. So please, please, 
we we know sometimes you present, you come here to say, well, yes, you want to say, we don't need saviors. We need true partners. So I think that's where I'm going to stay. So it's just to share with my heart the, the crying of our people just who want to live in their dignity. Like me, I live in Germany. So it's not easy, but we are, every day we are fighting. We are fighting to build something. Even it's hard, but that's what we do. And I think everyone needs that possibility to fight to build his life in his country. So that's the only thing we ask the world. It's to let us that opportunity. They take us from, they took us from Africa, our grand grand um, parents. So they brought us, I, we didn't ask to come here, but we fought to get that territory to be ours. So it's ours. So they can, they can do whatever they want to, maybe they think they're gonna kill us all, but they want, we're still gonna fight and we still, and we will rise up. So, well, the, the, the nation of Haiti just want to let the world know, yes, we are human. We brief as you do. We love our children and we want to build our country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabby, for your very uh, moving presentation. I am crying with you and many Canadians are crying alongside of Haitians and um, um, and we desperately want our country to show respect to Haiti and to do the right thing, to be accountable, to pay reparations, to do what must be done um, for the crimes that have been committed. So I just want to remind uh, the audience that we are going to be raising money for Gabby's foundation, Fondation uh, Julia et Jade, and you can, uh, we're going to do this through the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, and so uh, we will put our information in the chat if you would like to connect with us and send a donation, we will compile everything and send it directly to Gabby, and I also want to take this opportunity to mention that in the chat we have put a link to to an action petition to stand in solidarity with the Haitian people by sending a letter to our foreign affairs minister, Melanie Jolie, and it will go also go to the other opposition critics saying no military intervention in Haiti. So that action network letter, open letter will be put in the chat as well. So now we will turn it over to our final speaker of the evening, uh, Gary August. Gary was also featured as well in Elaine's documentary. He was born in Bel Air, the uh, center of Port-au-Prince. And he uh, joined the first group of cadets who started the current ha uh, Haiti National Police at a time of great political turmoil in the country many years ago. Gary stays in touch with his uh, uh, native country, many of his comrades there. And he offers a unique perspective on the current political crisis facing Haiti. He is now living with his family in Chilliwack, British Columbia, and he is an entrepreneur. Gary, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, before I start, I would like to thank all the previous speakers and for your heartfelt words and comments about Haiti. And uh, I would like to thank the Canadian um, Foreign Policy Institute. Especially, I'd like to thank Tamara for all the organization you guys put uh, behind this event. Um, and uh, and a special thank to Elaine Bouillard. Uh, Elaine, you don't know how much uh, you mean to us, Haitian, because um, if, if uh, if you take an individual, one Haitian, and you start detailing what happened in 2004, it will be hard for us to have a proper document, uh, a video or something that explain um, what happened and, and um, what happened to our democracy in Haiti. And uh, also, we wouldn't be able to make a link, 
a connection to what's going on to Haiti right now. Um, and of course, the, the film is, is a tool, but as present today, witnessing what's going on in Haiti, um, I believe it, it doesn't matter if you're Haitian, Canadian, or wherever you are in the world, it is our responsibility to denounce what's going on and uh, to voice our concern to what Canada, USA, France, and so many other countries are doing to our nation. Um, as uh, as Haitian Canadian, I'm uh, I'm very disappointed by the kind of diplomacy and politic the Canadian government is uh, is displaying in Haiti for the last I believe the last uh, decade. Within since 2011, the Canada we used to have in Haiti is no longer the same. Um, I believe in the past when when uh, when you see a white man or somebody, a Caucasian uh, walking down the street, usually when they have a flag of Canada in the bag or backpack, you that's a signal it's someone who you should be trusted, it's a friend, it's someone who loves Haiti. And I think this is being um, destroyed by the kind of policy that right now Canada is having toward Haiti. Um, it's uh, it's again embarrassing to see uh, until today, um, based on the last um, <clears throat> comment made by our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, that uh, they're still looking at intervening militarily in Haiti to fix our problem. Um, I think we have to stand up and we have to stand up within Canada to tell Canadian this is what's happening. So at least so people know what uh, Justin Trudeau is up to in Haiti. Um, when we say Canada involvement in the 2004, uh, it's, it's, it's our way to say the world community, I mean, the US and friends, all of those countries always control our government indirectly. Um, that's the way to maintain the statu quo. Now, um, uh, the last time I spoke about this event, I was very emotional because um, where I'm living right now, I'm, I feel safe. I feel protected. I can find food. I have running hot water. I have everything I need just because I can freely go to work and earn a living for my family. In Haiti, it's not the case. Like, uh, uh, Gabi was explaining, you cannot even leave your home to go to, to buy whatever. I, when I send money to friends in Haiti, I'm even afraid for them going to pick up the money because they may get kidnapped. So it's, it's a constant fear that we are living while we are in Haiti, in Canada, for our Asian brothers and sisters. And also it's a constant fear for those living in Haiti. And, and when, when, when we talk about um, fixing the problem in Haiti, we forgot and we kind of ignored the way Canada, US and French, they are treating the problem in Ukraine. It's totally different. It's unbalanced, it's a different thing. Um, Haiti right now is not at war with any country. We're not at war. We have a bunch of gang and we, People call them gang. They are a bunch of terrorists, and which are which are also which can be called political mind that is in place in certain popular area in Haiti for them to place themselves in a position when there is an election, so they can guarantee themselves getting power. And this is happening because you can see it in Cité Soleil. That's where it started in Bel Air, where I'm from. And that's very, very, very strong. And now in Matissa, uh, 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 where there's a major gun blocking the south, going now you're seeing other area like Pétionville because when people left the hot area like Cité Soleil, Bel Air, they move up to Pétionville, other area where it's kind of peaceful to live a life. Now it's no longer because gang also taking over this area. So technically what you're having now, you have everywhere in the country being controlled by gang and 
and nobody can do anything about it. No one can do anything. When I say no one, nobody, because you have a, a government in place. I, I believe, uh, and we all can agree, an illegal government in place. Among the member of the government, lots of those ministers were sanctioned by Canada because they were part of gang or they are supporting gang, the financing gang, or they are committing crime in the, in the country. And you have the same Canada wanting to sending forces in Haiti to do what? To, to rescue Haitians or to support this government that is a criminal government uh, that is there only to guarantee the elite control over the country. That is what we're facing right now. Uh, I, I won't use my whole time. I'm, I want to leave more time for questions for people to voice, uh, ask questions so we can have more time to, to speak. But what I wanted to say here, it's a time for a reset in Haiti. We have a situation that requires an emergency to be done in Haiti because it is impossible. It is not fair and it is not right to have a free country being bugged by so many other nations you can't even live, like I normally travel to Haiti every year. It's been three years, I avoid going because I don't want to be causing problems for my family. Going there, you look like you're a foreigner or from somewhere else, you can't drive a nice car, they will pick you up, they will, they will kidnap you. You stay out for your safety, but that is not right. It's like I'm being forced to stay out of my home because of the actions of so many powerful guys in Haiti like, uh, 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 Jafrika explaining earlier those elites who are providing gang, gangs with guns to control the population. And that is not right. And I would like to say this, it's time for Canada, especially this message is for our prime minister, Justin Trudeau, to stop the hypocrisy. You cannot be saying one thing on TV and, and in the press by making nice art press conference and in on, uh, in reality, you are the one stopping the process. What does what do we what do we have to do? What do we have to do? When I say we Haitians, what do we have to do to gain back our our country from the control of the elite and some powerful countries? And this is the question I believe a lot of us ask ourselves when we elected a democratic, or a democratic election with Jim Metronary said, we gave power back, we gain power back by having an elected government to conduct our affair without any influence from foreign forces. Now, as you can explain, we all exceed from the movie, from the show that uh, he was forced out just because, because he was a part of them it wasn't a guaranteed control, then we have what we have now. We have the Piashtika, the a group of fraudsters, illegal, Haitian, or some of them linked to some mafia group controlling every phase of the country. Now it's, it's talking is one, doing these things is a one, but we need to speak up because right now there are a lot of victims in Haiti, like Gabi mentioned. A lot of women being raped. They're being raped, killed after extorting their family what for money. And they, they, they destroy the body. They can't even find the body to bury it. Can you imagine this? Right? So it is not just like speaking. Now we're having a session. That's good. We're voicing our concern, but something gotta be done. There has to be something has to be done. There has to be a reset. We need Haiti back. Now, uh, if you talk about um, intervention military forces going to Haiti, um, for different, there's a big divide on that. A lot of people are for, and, and me, I don't see it as the solution. Reason why, because I know, I know, and I know because I know there are a lot of police officers in Haiti right now who are capable, who are able to fix the problem if they have the proper tool and they have the right leadership in place to give them the support they need to do the job, they can. I have been in situation myself when I was in Haiti. Hey, listen, I was one of the few who came out after the army was disbanded. The street wasn't safe. We had, you had an army left with all the guns, right? But we were out there. The same thing, those right now who are 
in the force, like a lot of my friends in the force, I talk to them. I know what's going on as well. They can't, the hands are tied because to be able to do an intervention, it has to come from above. And who's above them? A bunch of illegal guys, they are there just to protect themselves. Like you have the prime minister who's somehow uh, was named in the investigation of the killing of the president. He's in power. Do you think he's gonna move aside so they can persecute him? No. So therefore having a force going in Haiti to support this government is another stab to the Haitians back because it's gonna give them the security they need to have another fake election and putting someone else in power against the Haitians will, which will result in another five, 10 years of protest because we will not back away from this because we cannot give up, we will not give our country to some foreign forces, to some uh, corrupt elite who wants to make money while we are suffering, while the country is being destroyed. And that's that's all I wanted to say. And I will leave the rest for anyone who has anything else to add. But I'll tell I'll say this, Ellen. I wish one day the Haitian people will be able to put you somewhere where we can thank you for all the work you've done, because this is a great tool that we have right now. We can show to the world in many languages what Canada is doing what they have done in 2004 and what they're probably going to continue doing if we don't stop them. And I want to thank you, Elaine, for this. And uh, I'll leave the rest of my time for something, someone else. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary, for your presentation. It is time for the Canadian government to stop the hypocrisy. And it is time for a reset. Haitians need Haiti back. And we really need to help with that. So it is time for our question and answer period. I uh, see that there are some questions in the chat and in the question and answer function. Uh, please feel free to write any comments and questions there. And we will read a couple and then uh, um, uh, you know, have our panelists answer it and, and we'll do it that way. So I... I see that there is a couple of questions to to Elaine, and um, one of the questions is, uh, and this relates to the webinar that we did with you last year. Did the the film? Did your film get translated translated into Creole? It is such a, an important tool. And then the other question is, can you speak about the aid organizations in the country? So in your film. You uh, talk about um, about the uh, uh, Quebec, um, I think Amnesty International and the uh, Quebec Oxfam and the Toronto-based Development and Peace Organizations that really undermined uh, the political uh, uh, government of of, uh, of Aristide. And uh, so if you could speak to the aid organizations that operated in the past and today, and also a little bit more about your film and how it's being used as, a, as an effective tool, that would be great. Thanks. Can you hear me? Okay, well, first of all, uh, I want to correct you right away. Amnesty International never undermined Haiti. Amnesty International was trying to get the world's attention to Haiti. And they were in my film and um, gave a very good interview. The, you know, Gerardo Ducos was, uh, you know, documenting everything. They were trying to get people to listen. They couldn't. They couldn't get anybody to listen to them. But unfortunately, Oxfam, Development and Peace, um, other aid organizations, they were, yeah. Not only did they collaborate with the Canadian government to smear the and and the, and the world really the, the, to smear the Aristide government but after the after the coup they were silent they didn't say anything about the atrocities uh, the 10,000 people that were killed after the coup so that was a very shameful period <clears throat> and it was in Quebec it was the Quebec NGOs um, Quebec has had a kind of a turnaround on Haiti. Uh, probably uh, Jean Saint Ville can speak to that. They um, 
they admitted on a Radio Canada documentary that Canada had been part of the coup. In, in Anglophone Canada, we have never admitted that we have been part of the coup in Haiti on the major media. It just, it's kind of like impolite conversation or something. They just can't admit that. So uh, Quebec is hopefully, I started to turn around and really try to do something because a lot of the politicians and a lot of the aid groups that supported the coup were from Haiti, I mean, from, from Quebec. Um, unfortunately, the film never got translated into Creole because things just fell apart in Haiti and it was impossible. I, I, I couldn't find anybody to actually do the translation. It's a really big job and I was directed to go to Haiti and it just, and so I surveyed everybody that I could that gave money and we gave it to aid groups in Haiti partners in health and groups like that. And uh, that's what happened to that money. And was there, what was the other question you had? Oh, I think you've answered them both about oh, okay. the, about the yeah. aid groups. Yeah, maybe just um, th this question asks, um, uh, are you disillusioned with NGOs following how critical they were in propping up Canadian imperialism globally, but most notoriously in Haiti? That that's the exact question. So, if you had anything more to to say, oh well, they, it, it's hard to take a broad brush, you know, to NGOs, um, but you do more. They, I mean, the bigger bigger NGOs are sometimes not not as good as the small ones, but they can be. You just have to check them out like you. Partners in Health has a long, long history in Haiti. 85% uh, they're, they're, they're a, a, a medical group. They've been there what now, Jeffrika, about 30 years in Haiti. So they, they're very trusted. Um, there's Soil, which is another great group. It's been in Haiti through thick and thin. The groups that have been there for a very long time, um, in Oxfam, Quebec was the main culprit. I can't, but Oxfam, you know, unfortunately, I learned that Oxfam UK was toting the same line on Haiti. So it was very disillusioning for people that worked in the NGOs, like Development and Peace and like um, Oxfam, and also the umbrella group in in Montreal. They they did a shameful. Um, thing too when they they join together because it you know it's one thing to to smear uh, uh, Haiti but it's a, the governments to do it but it was another thing when the Canadian NGOs did it then everybody believed well the Aristide government should go it must be corrupt it must be you know, doing all these horrible things and because the NGOs were saying so. So they're, they're Canadian, they must be the good guys, right? So that really, that really, really did hurt Haiti a lot. Yeah. But I'll end that on that. Yeah. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Jeffrey Kaiti or Gary, would you like to say anything about the non-governmental organizations in Canada and how they were towards, how they were or are towards Haiti. Yeah, well, this is something that in the Canada Haiti Action Network uh, we addressed uh, because uh, it became evident to us that uh, a lot of money, both in the United States and in Canada, was funneled through the NGOs, especially the ones that had a leftist reputation uh, in order to, you know, isolate. Uh, the legitimate government, uh, uh, the Famila Valas government, uh, and uh, therefore make it easier uh, for the coup to take place. Uh, and uh, alternatives is, is uh, one uh, because uh, Quebec uh, w was, you know, because sometimes Canadians forget that, you know, Quebec is given an opportunity to play nation when dealing with black countries in Africa and in the Caribbean. And so it's not a coincidence that people like Denis Paradis, Denis Coderre, uh, you know, these folks were all over uh, uh, the Haiti file uh, because someone like Denis Coderre goes to Haiti as a special envoy and all of a sudden he's a big shot, 
you know, uh, he represents, you know, the voice of uh, the great Canadians. And, 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 you know, unfortunately, you cannot look at the behavior of these individuals uh, in those scenarios without realizing that they have a different image <laughs> of themselves uh, uh, when they are uh, in, in such environments. Uh, and so, yeah, the NGOs, uh, our experience has been that they played a key role, for instance, in getting uh, some of the Latin American countries to participate uh, in the MINUSTA, right? It was Brazil that was leading the, the MINUSTA. So all of these massacres that were taking place, you know, that's Lula's Brazil, uh, you know? Uh, so, you know, they, uh, Peter Hallward's book, uh, you know, details, how this was done, um, you know, how money was flown. Uh, there's also a great article by uh, Kevin Skerritt, our comrade, who had written about, you know, some of the uh, money, how in one weekend, you know, the, the Canadian government sent money to this uh, NGO in Haiti, NCHR. You know, I work in government funding agency for over 27 years. I've never seen an application come for it to be approved in three days, especially on a weekend, okay? So obviously what was happening is that these NGOs in Haiti were doing the work that uh, the people who were pushing the coup uh, wanted them to do. And they accused uh, uh, the legitimate government of all kinds of crimes. Meanwhile, activists from Lavalas were being killed right, left and center uh, and they never reported it. Like, I mean, there are large numbers of massacres that happened uh, when the first uh, uh, troops arrived, uh, uh, even before the UN uh, arrived, because, you know, it, it, people may not catch that well, but the first groups that were there were Americans, Canadians, uh, people from Chile, and they massacred a whole bunch of people. And, and these things were never even reported. Uh, and, and as you know, even the cholera, which the UN denied, uh, and, and oftentimes in the media, when they talk about the cholera, they, they, they tie it with the earthquake. There's no link between the cholera and the earthquake. The cholera was uh, brought to Haiti by soldiers who weren't tested and who were contaminated and they contaminated the waters of Haiti in October, 2010. It's the same year as the earthquake, but it wasn't caused by the earthquake. Uh, uh, these soldiers were there because of the coup. They came to consolidate the coup and they brought the cholera and the United Nations lied uh, saying that, you know, uh, they don't know where the cholera came from. When people kept on pushing, they said, well, this is not what's important now. What's important is to save Haitian lives. People kept on insisting. And even their own studies proved that it was the UN that brought the cholera to Haiti. And when that was proven, lawyers went to New York to try to get reparations for the survivors. And instead of helping Haitians find justice, the US government under Barack Obama, the so-called first black president, okay? Uh, instead of helping the Haitians, uh, you know, sent their lawyers uh, to, uh, to protect the UN and say that the UN has uh, immunity, therefore they cannot be sued uh, for killing upwards of 50,000 Haitians by cholera. And this means 1 million were contaminated and, and got sick. Uh, and it's not fun to uh, uh, to get cholera, and and people need to also realize that everything has to do with class in Haiti. You will not find a light-skinned Haitian who have died of cholera, okay? Because the structure that was established in the country to uh, to put the the blackest, the poorest Haitians in in, in uh, position of vulnerability, you will see it also in the cholera contagion. Because all you need to survive cholera is access to drinking water, and who doesn't have drinking water? The majority of the population, and and so, you know, there's multiple level of that crime that has been happening. Because when you deny a people of government, uh, 
of course, you know, and you see journalists going and, and, and criticizing Haitian society for the fact that there was no government after the earthquake to take care of them. Well, no, there was no government because you collapsed the government in 2004 and put thugs in power. Um, thank you so much, Jeff Kaiti. Elaine, I see that you put your hand up. I wasn't sure if you wanted to respond to that. And then we could give Gary and Gabby an opportunity to talk about the foreign NGOs in the country. Well, I think we should talk about the, what's going on right now. And we don't have that much time left. And I think we should ask Gabby and what Gary what they think we should do now, what they'd like to see. And at concrete action, should we write letters? Should we do demonstrations? You know, what, yeah. So people listening can have some idea because I think we only have 20 minutes left. Uh, great idea. Uh, Gary and then Gabby, would you like to, uh, to respond to that or the other things that you've heard? Please go ahead, Gary. Uh, well, uh, what, back to what uh, um, Civil was uh, saying about the NGOs and, uh, and to what we should be doing going forward and how to tell the wall, technically. Um, for the NGOs, I think it was a total failure. Um, when you, when you, if you remember how much billions were sent to Haiti after the earthquake, and uh, and and until now, you will still find structure where people could still live on the tent if it wasn't the gang situation. Um, so technically, uh, the way the operation of the NGOs in Haiti weren't there for to fix a problem. It. It was a patch, technically it was a patch, but the majority part of the money was spent in the operation itself. So technically if they, they were seeing they sent billions to Haiti um, and the crumbs of that really was used to serve the people. So I don't think the formula, the, the formula that's right now, the way the country is, I don't think we are ready for a big, NGO coming in to do whatsoever, seriously, because um, the impact on the population is not effective. It's not effective. The money is being spent on plane tickets, uh, traveling, sending technicians to do so, so many things. And really when on the ground, what is really needed is not there. I remember speaking to, uh, to some people who, was, who were in Haiti after the earthquake. They were looking for basic things to help people. They couldn't find them while there were billions being spent in Haiti after the earthquake. So that's my opinion on that. Now, it's again, if we, if we look at then to now, it's exactly the same thing. You, you, you see a movement into Haiti to patch a problem, and, and, but that will not fix the problem. It will just take us to somewhere where the statu quo will be men. So what, what I think we should be doing is to uh, educate people like we're doing now, educate uh, the taxpayers, Canadian uh, people who are paying taxes and our government is using our money uh, into the military, sending there to support a, an illegal government and, 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 and continue with the same system that is not in favor of the Haitian, not supported by the Haitian. It's a group of uh, criminal in place just to protect the statue called the elite. So technically what we have to do is to uh, educate the Canadian people to tell them this is what you call your government is doing in Haiti. Tell them the truth because uh, it's time for they being accountable for what they say. If they say on TV or uh, at the press conference, yes, we're gonna help Haitians, we're gonna do this, but on the ground, it's not what they're doing. I'll give you an example. We have, uh, after the, the killing of the president, there were so many accord, so many meetings being done just to find a solution to for a transition. Um, the the core group opposed to other options, like for example, the the uh, we have um, the Montana accord that is opposed by the core group. They don't allow them the same strength that the Ariel uh, accord had or has because. They 
don't find themselves represented or I don't know, somehow they don't trust a group that is broad or uh, that is well represented by the, by, the, by the majority of the political parties. So technically what we have to do is to tell Canada to hands off, take your hands off our Haitian politics, not to say it on TV, on radio, but on, in the press, but really in reality, leave the politics for Haitian without any, 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 any implication because technically it's like a, a circle. We're turning around circle. We're going back to 2004 and uh, the coup has happened. They bring a, somebody from somewhere else, putting him in as a prime minister is undo everything I still did. Now creating a system in place to have Matéli, Matéli establishing a system where the same system of the Duvalier remain and you have a people, a group of a nation that is being oppressed unsafe, being killed every day, and not having a system in place. Right now, we have no elected government. Can you imagine? You have no elected president, no senator, no uh, member of parliament, nothing. Ma even the mayor of the any city in Haiti is not elected. Everybody is illegal. It's a group of friends being in position for because they are in politics, not because the nation decided you will represent me. Nobody's elected. So technically, because Canada is involved, because we are involved, we need to let the world know what is happening in Haiti. And this is a good forum for that. And I think we should do more of this. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, Gabby, please go ahead. Yes, I think um, it can take like whatever, you know, we can do like petition, demonstration, giving voice to the people of Haiti to speak, you know, I, I allow them to give the, their, what they are living, you know, it's not just through the, their embassy or call group or whatever NGO working in the country. Yeah, it's a, everybody say that we, we, we see it in Haiti. It's a total failure of the NGO because you know, the reality is that sincerely, they don't give a damn about Haitian people. And um, and um, so they just came here to get their money and build their life in their country. But Haitian life doesn't matter for, for them. And so that's in, this morning I was saying that because um, I was in a meeting and uh, because when they come here, it's like they are, you know, I got the money, I have the power, so I'm the boss. So it's not about really coming to work with the Asian people for them. It's coming to work for themselves with themselves. So we're just here to to make the decor for them, you know. And um, um, I think um, what we are living here, it's a uh, it's racism. It's um. It's, um, it's, I think, well, it's the same thing who conduct those people from Europe to go to Africa to, to allow them to take people because we are different. And uh, to bring them somewhere, you know, erase their, you know, their story, you know, change everything in their lives because one of the most important thing for someone it's uh, to know their, you know, their ancestry, where they from, and the Western people show with us every day. They build their everything they can think just to make sure they can stay in contact with their past. But we don't have that opportunity. I would like to know where I come from. You know, I I know my dad, of course, my grandpa. So. Now, if I can go further, I, I won't be able to do that. So we don't have that possibility because they took us, they changed our, our name and everything. So we are in a process to build ourselves every day. And unfortunately, we cannot do it because every time we try to do it, those people, their, their grand grandchildren, they are here right now to remind us you not human. So we are the one who can think. So, well, I think I talked about it before and after, right after, um, even before 
um, the, the assassination of the president, you get those. So some Haitian people, it's not perfect because we are human, we are not perfect. Everywhere, so human are perfect. And of course, they trying because always they said we they don't have alternative in Haiti. They don't know so many different political parties. We can talk, blah, blah, blah. So those people try to bring much of the people they can around the table and to, you know, to give to the nation a proposition. So how we can, you know, um, do it. So um, it's Montana. So what happened with Montana? What happened? So they, they didn't even take the time or opportunity to even ask the Asian people what they think. Right away, they bring their, their own solution. The core group come with Ariel Henry. So we have to, to tell it. The core group bring, put Ariel Henry in power. So, and since, so they try to do their own, they, to, to, to come up with their own solution for us. Well, you know, and, um, and I think um, you, as citizens of those country, countries need to, to, to add accountability to the government, to your government, because you can just take people's money to destroy another country just because you don't like those people or they didn't serve your purpose. So we are free human beings. So and the, and the, and the, of course, so last the, the last decision of the Biden administration to do that humanitarian program. That's to it's just to kill the country because right now you got teachers, you got even police officers. They right now they got their this, uh, their their immigration office to get their passport. So everybody right now has access to leave. You think it's, I think Biden could come up with some, you know, better solution, you know, but what they have, and just to show you, it's not, it's not helping Haitian, which is important for them. It's how to get control of everything in that country, even the people the soil, everything they can. So they just, and that's the reason, unfortunately, their powerful medias don't really talk about what's going on on the ground. But I remember in 2004, all those media came 2003, we got all those media in Haiti talking about the government killing, the government do this, the government, that's what happened in 2003, 2004. But right now, every day, you get massacres, kidnapping. They are raping women. Where I live, it's a will fight. That's what we're fighting. We got just for two, two, for 20, 2020, 20, yeah, 2022, we have about 140 cases of rapes. And the victim, they are between three years old to 17 years old. So how are you gonna build a society with the, that kind of, you know, people who's been traumatized so early? Uh, uh, Gabby, it, it's, it, thank you for sharing this. It's really, it's so awful what's going on. It's, 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 it's heartbreaking and we need to do something. Um, with your permission, I would like to be able to go over two minutes because um, I, I'd, I'd like uh, Jeffrey Kaiti to have an opportunity to share in just one or two minutes very quickly about, about Canada's 
um, ambassador to the UN, Bob Ray's position about the Haitian-led solution and uh, the Montana group and, you know, and what you think about that, just very quickly. And then we'll turn it over to Akila to let us know about the next upcoming events and what we are doing as our three organizations uh, to respond to this uh, crisis. Jeff Akiti, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the buzzword Haitian led is in a, uh, everybody's mouth, but it means nothing, okay? Uh, uh, it, they're just saying it because there was a Haitian led initiative, which is the Montana, uh, and which I naturally would not have supported because some of the people who participated in the 2004 coup were leaders of the Montana Corps, but they made an effort to go and talk to people. Uh, and so it truly is a, uh, um, a pan-Haitian thing. And, and they never took the pretense to say that, you know, this replaces a national election, okay? They, because they admitted that the, the, the gang regime that was established by Hillary Clinton and, and, and her group uh, destroyed every opportunity to have a um, constitutional solution. And therefore they came up with, with this approach. And the United States and Canada did everything uh, to derail uh, the Montana Accord. Uh, and, and Montana lost uh, its, uh, uh, I guess, attraction because the US government forced them to go and sit with the PHTK gang. So whichever way you look at it, it's the criminals in Haiti are being protected by Washington. That's the problem. And so if Canada wants to help, uh, they don't need to go into Haiti. Again, the people that they've identified, and I think uh, 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 their whiteness is what provides them this untouchability. And this needs to be addressed. You know, we cannot have, you know, people here saying that they want to have you know, equity, diversity, and inclusion in Canada. And then when they go to Haiti, all of the uh, business class in Haiti is white. <laughs> so we don't need equity, diversity, and inclusion in Haiti. How did that happen? Okay, so it's been discovered that these guys are enriching themselves by arming gangs. It's a criminal activity. They need to be arrested. That's what Canada can do because they have collected the information that shows that these people um, are involved in criminal activity. And, and, and again, uh, there's also the perception that this thing is, of the gangs is so complex, no one can solve it. It's not true, okay? 90% of the weapons are coming from the United States. If they don't have ammunition, the gangs cannot operate. So it's because there's no political will. And, 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 and these crimes are happening all over the Caribbean, not just in Haiti, Jamaica, but, uh, the Bahamas, all of them have the same problem. So the United States needs to stop sending weapons uh, to Haiti. Um, and the rest will happen, just like Gary said. There are plenty of good police officers uh, in Haiti still, and the population can take care of them. Of course, the problem will be you're going to have a few, you know, white families in Haiti who are going to be running for their lives. Now, can we stomach the fact that these criminals, if they don't arrest them, some of them might get killed? That's what the troops are being sent to Haiti for. The responsibility to protect requires another question. Protect who from what? Okay, the troops are being sent there to protect the 15 white mafia families, not the black Haitian population. That's the truth. Um, uh, thank you. So one of the solutions is is disarmament to stop flooding Haiti with weapons, just like we need to stop flooding Ukraine with weapons. But now I would like to turn it over quickly just for um, for our uh, VAU intern, Akila Sandu, who's a student at the University of Toronto, to let us know about upcoming events, and then we will quickly wrap up our webinar. So Akila, over to you, please. Thanks. Thanks, Tamara. And thank you to all of our wonderful panelists and everyone who spoke. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Okay, so I'll try to be quick. Um, 
the first event that I wanted to highlight is our webinar being held this Sunday on February 19th. Um, it'll be discussing the war in Ukraine and NATO's role in perpetuating the conflict. It's being organized by VOW alongside the Canadian uh, Canada-wide Peace and Justice Network and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Canada, WILF. And we'll feature speakers from Canada, the US and Ukraine. And next, I wanted to promote our International Weekend of Action, Peace Now, Stop the War, Stop NATO, which is being organized by the Canada Wide Peace and Justice Network, including VOW and WILF. And this Weekend of Action will be taking place one week from today. So from Thursday, February 23rd, until Sunday, February 26th. And we encourage everyone to please attend and help plan protests in your city, as well as online events um, that'll be held across Canada, the UK, and other countries in Europe as well. And next, I believe the link for this was already popped in the chat earlier, but um, the next event I wanted to highlight is the upcoming webinar, which will be hosted by the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute on Thursday next week at 7 p.m. EST. Uh, this webinar will discuss Canada's colonial role in the Caribbean, past and present, and will feature a discussion with um, Paula Hastings, the author of Dominion Over Palm and Pine, A History of Canadian Aspirations in the British Caribbean, and author Peter James, the author of Bankers and Empire, How Wall Street Colonized the Caribbean. Another thing I wanted to promote is our parliamentary petition, which is calling on the Trudeau government to drop the F-35 fighter jets deal. Um, the full life cycle cost of these jets is projected to be around $70 billion, billions of dollars, which could be used to address urgent issues like the current healthcare crisis we are facing today. Uh, we're trying to get 2,000 signatures by March 6th, so please sign and share the petition with whoever you can. And lastly, I wanted to highlight our youth letter, which is calling on the Canadian government to sign on to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, the Trudeau government has asserted that it cannot ratify the treaty um, due to our membership in NATO. However, it's important that we as Canadians take a stance against nuclear weapons. Uh, this campaign will be open until mid-March, so for anyone 30 years old or younger, please consider adding your name to it. And that's all for me, so I'll pass it back to Tamara for closing remarks. Thanks so much, Akila. So I want to let everybody know that based on uh, this uh, this webinar, we are going to be, our three organizations are going to be uh, writing a letter to the Prime Minister and to our Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, you know, making the demands that were articulated in the webinar today. We also have a delegation of Canadian Voice of Women members who are going down to New York, and we have a meeting planned with Ambassador Bob Ray and his staff, and we will be bringing this information as well to his attention. And we plan on doing a social media campaign. Um, and some of us have also been par participating in, in, in disruptions as well. Um, so we have been trying to do uh, something. So. We are going to save the chat. We are going to send out a follow-up email with uh, the things that we presented uh, just now to you so that you can continue to stay involved because uh, we're going to need all of us working together to change course on Canadian foreign policy and to get the restitution and the reparations that Haiti deserves. So please still stick with us. Please uh, get involved. I want to give a big thanks to our panelists, Elaine and Jeffrey Kaiti and Gabby and Gary. And thanks very much to Akila for making the presentation at the end. And a big thanks to Bianca with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute for doing all of the technical and the behind the scenes work. And thank you so to all of you for participating tonight. We really appreciate. Thanks, everyone. And uh, take care. Good evening and goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Tamara. Bye. Merci. Merci. Merci, Gabi. Bye. -bye. Bye.